Not going back for column chromatography. This is mostly used for separations, often on a very large scale. Uh, much bigger than shown here in many industrial situations. Um, one of the things I always, I always say is, when you look at standards for a lot of stuff we're interested in, they are incredibly expensive, but plants produce them for free. And I usually offer a project on using column chromatography to separate various molecules out, uh, which can then be used in analysis. So maybe something to bear in mind in semester two when we're thinking about this. Uh, of course, we wouldn't allow people standing on a stool like that these days. Um, that was probably back in the 1950s that photograph was taken, I suspect. Uh, okay, so see this video and review the learned side material on, 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 on column chromatography. Uh, if you read a bit further down in the so you see you mentioned size exclusion. We're not really interested in that. It's outside the scope of this molecule, more associated with biological uh, systems. Okay, so review that material. Uh, okay, here's a question. You should be able to work this out for yourself. I'm not going to uh, mention what it is. You should be able to figure it out yourself. And also see the chem guide link on column chromatography for more background. So link there. Okay, HPLC, a technique we've done in the lab and is probably the single most important analytical technique. HPLC has two interchangeable meanings as quoted here. Here the separation is done with a stationary phase enclosed in the metal column, metal tube really. The ones shown here are about 10 centimetres in length, but you can get bigger ones and, and many which are quite a lot smaller. Uh, read these characters yourself, pause the video if you need to. Uh, you might think that LearnSAR would have something on HPLC, but it doesn't. Uh, there are many good resources out there. Many, many good resources. Okay, so a schematic di diagram of a HPLC system. Uh, we'll look at the components in a bit more detail as we go through the rest of this lecture. HPLC systems these days are computer controlled and it's possible to mix different mobile phases during the process. Uh, this is typically done to separate components with different polarities. Now, this process is referred to as gradient elution. Uh, if you only use one mobile phase, it's called isocratic elution, and it's used for the reasons given here. Sophisticated control of mobile phase mixing is possible using modern systems. Uh, most of the systems we have, uh, I think, a quaternary. So we can, in principle, mix four solvents. I've never done this. I've mostly only used two, but it's, it's perfectly possible to do. Uh, so here's an example of a method. We start off with 100% of A and 0% of B, which is methanol, and we switch over after about 10 minutes to 70% of buffer and 30% of methanol, and then back to the original mixture, which we can graph as looking like this. Uh, so this will typically facilitate the separation of different of components of different polarities. Uh, so the degasser, going back to the schematic diagram, if the mobile phase contains any dissolved gases, they may form a bubble, which under the high pressures involved may block the column. Um, a degasser is a vacuum system that removes any dissolved gases. When a HPLC is running, this is the noise you can hear. Historically, degassing was done by sparging with helium, a very slow and expensive process and taken from me, not always very successful. Uh, the pump is the heart of HPLC. Uh, it mentions there uh, 1000 psi, 70 bar, so 70 bar is about 70 times atmospheric pressure. The pump is pulseless compared to say a peristaltic pump in a fish tank which pumps and stops pumping and pumps and then pumps again. It also pumps at a very closely controlled rate. Uh, which makes the analysis possible, of course. The process can be controlled from the pump by pressing various buttons, but it's almost always done using software control. Some systems still use injection from hypodermic into a loop, loop uh, volume loop valve system, where the loop is a very accurate measure of, say, 20 microliters. However, these days, most often, an auto sampler system is used, such as the example given in this somewhat for out of focus and wobbly video. But I'm sure you'll get the point, so have a look at the video. Um, some typical column chroma characteristics. Uh, it's just a, an example, so I wouldn't worry too much about this. Uh, many column systems are available, ranging cost from a few hundreds to thousands of pounds, uh, perhaps many thousands of pounds. 
Used properly, they should have very long working lives, however. Okay, C8 to C18. There are two main systems used. C18, where a chain of 18 carbon atoms is bound to silica. This is useful for small molecules, as beta carotene or caffeine and, and many, many more. C8 ligands, with 8 carbon atoms being bound, is used for larger molecules, such as proteins, for example. And there's a couple of examples of C18 and C8 column, column materials shown here. Um, okay, reverse or normal phase. In polarity terms, two systems are possible. Reverse and normal phase, as described above. Um, reverse phase is most widely used. Another contrast to the TLC system we discussed earlier, which is normally normal phase. In reverse phase, non-polar molecules bind to non-polar uh, stationary phase, giving them longer retention times than for polar molecules. So the more polar a molecule is, the more quickly it will be eluded. Uh, this video is silent, but it, it's a nice sort of walkthrough. What, what I'll probably do is I'll record a voiceover for this at some point. Uh, but you can have a look at it now and see if you can figure out what's happening and see if my voiceover is any, any, any better. Uh, probably not. Um, here's the results, which you are familiar with. The typical HPLC chromatogram, retention time against peak area. Um, each of the peaks represents a separated compound, as the diagram says. Uh, reverse retention time, beg your pardon, is used to identify components. The system records this, of course, and peak area automatically. Uh, peak height can be useful for optimizing systems, and the system will report this, but peak area is what we use for quantification. As usual, standard and needed, and calibration lines, and all the usual stuff we do. And there's an example down there, which you're familiar with, you're familiar with of course, from previous work we've done. Um, detectors. HPLC detectors are typically set up to detect absorption of single wavelength, which may be in the visible or UV region. It says UK in the notes, that should be UV. Uh, this means that different analyses are used for different molecules. Here's a schematic of a, a typical detector. Um, it's quite tightly folded to allow quite quite a, a relatively long light path to allow various optical characteristics to be optimized. Sometimes diode array detectors are used. Uh, these can detect at multiple wavelengths, producing what is called a fingerprint, of which here is one example. Uh, it's not easy to analyze by itself, and they're often compared to libraries of com co compounds, often using expert systems. These libraries tend to be in particular compound classes, so it's not something you use necessarily when you're looking to analyze perhaps unknowns. Another type of detector it uses is refractive index. Um, you've used refractive index probably in the past using the refractometer. Uh, so, for example, this would work with solutions of sugars in water. Yeah, okay. Um, HPLC MS. Uh, one of the most well-known hyphenated systems uh, uses HPLC to separate mi mi mixtures and then carries out the analysis via mass spectroscopy. Uh, more on mass spectroscopy in a later lecture. And that's all, folks. Thanks for listening.